Welcome to Two Pints of Maggots and a Packet of Hooks, the fishing podcast. It's episode two of series two, and it's gone the glorious 16th, June the 16th. We have now got the rivers open. We've got some fantastic fish being shown already. Um, We've had a drop of rain after a pretty dry few weeks, and uh, the rivers are in fine fettle, which is great news. And great news as well, we've got a brilliant show lined up for you once again. As always, we'll talk through the press pack, anything that's interesting, caught my eye in the angling media, across social media, printed press, um, the monthlies and the weeklies, and of course the tackle shed. So if there's anything that's caught my eye as I've been wandering down the aisle of the local tackle shop, or whether it be something online, or again, something that's been highlighted in one of the magazines, we'll talk about that. And in the big chair for the big chat is 1987 world champion, Mr. Clive Branson. And this was a really, really interesting conversation. Uh, Clive has been through all sorts of trials and tribulations over the years. Um, It was really interesting to get his perspective on Wales, I guess, uh, where they are now, where they have been and where he expects them to go in the future. One of the great things speaking to Clive as well was about how innovative he's been over the years, Um, pretty much ahead of his time in a lot of respects. One of the very, very first match fishing websites that he created that's still running to this day. Um, And some of the things that he tried to introduce to the UK market, which were sort of um, laughed at at the time, things like pre-stretched low diameter line that we all use now. Um, especially across commercial fishing, uh, that was Clive's. He saw that as a as a bit of a niche and tried to get that into the UK market. So loads and loads of stuff. Really, really good chat. I, I promise you, you won't be disappointed with that. So let's uh, let's get cracking. Without further ado, let's dive into the press pack. Okay, kicking off in the press pack, I've got to start with an article that caught my eye last week's Angling Times, June the 15th, and that is the UK's biggest carp has caught. Now, I think under normal circumstances, we jump back sort of 20 years ago, a record would have been submitted and, and, and you know, the cap tour would have had lots of glory and, and their name down in history. But nowadays, it seems a lot more of a, of a big faff because of the way that fish have been moved and stocked and, and you know, bred on. The, and there's a bit of cloak and dagger as well. They don't want everybody chasing these fish. Uh, it's, it's a very strange um, scene in some respects, I think, is the carp fishing scene when it comes to these record-breaking fish. And, and I feel a bit sorry for the young lad. It's a 14-year-old kid called um, Jensen Price. And this fish is known as Marshall. It's come out of a venue called the Meadows Lake on Home Fen Complex, Cambridgeshire. And he talks about how he was doing a 24-hour session with his dad. Um, fisher rules state that because of the size, the bigger fish in Home Fen must be photographed in the water, uh, which is just as well because the young kid couldn't really lift it, bless him. So he then asked the question, will the young angler be putting his name in the record books? At the present, he remains undecided. He says, I'm not sure I want the hassle of submitting the claim. It won't affect my angling. For me, it's just about having fun in my fishing. His dad, Darren, confirmed that he won't be pushing his son to go off the record. Uh, I'd like to see him do a claim, but it's totally his decision. Um, he has a habit of catching big fish at a 35-pound pike recently. So why would we not want to do that? Why would he not want that accolade? It, it, I just find it fascinating that, claiming a record is now a hassle and, and a bit of a ball like and there's a subsection to this article where it says should marshall be the new british record and it talks about controversy has surrounded the home fen fish ever since their original biggest resident captain jack 
was denied the record by the BRC, uh, British Record Fish Committee, in 2018. They say we can't consider this a record because it was imported from Israel and stocked into the fishery at a high weight. Captain Jack was stocked at forty-one pound. Um, but however, this fish was uh, from the same batch, far lower weight of fifteen pound eight ounce in twenty thirteen. The BRFC also suggested the fish could only potentially be considered for the record list if they were stocked at no more than twenty-five percent of the claimed record weight. So yeah. It all seems a bit of a ball lake when it comes to carp fishing for records. And of course, the rest of the magazine is, is it's been released the day before opening day of season. So it's full of how to approach and attack a river and how you can, you know, prepare your kit, etc. So and, and that makes complete sense. But another thing that was quite nice in the mag was um, obviously staycations are a big thing now. Um, and there's a section where it says where to stay and fish your guide to Britain's best fishing holiday hotspots. And I didn't realize, um, apart from some of the usual suspects, I've just come back from four days at Lindholm. Fantastic. You know, a hot tub on your balcony overlooking the lakes. It's just brilliant. But I didn't realize how many glorious spots we have across the country from, you know, Carlisle down to Devon are all covered um, in this article. So if you do get a chance to get hold of the 15th of June. Um, edition of Angling Times and you're looking for a staycation with fishing included you know somewhere that can um, suit the whole family but also where you can sneak off for a few hours it may well be worth having a having a little look uh, in that edition. Moving on to this week's Angling Times and the articles that stand out of course are the captures of that first week of the river season along with some other notable captures as well but for me the biggest um, story in the paper and across social media has been around uh, Corder Boss Managing Director Danny Fairbrass and his battle with cancer which was on one of the recent podcasts um, of Corder and the article in the Angling Times talks actually about what Danny and his team are doing with regards to a clothing range that they've uh, launched called Cool Clothing and it's it's fantastic really because what he's doing and the team there at Corda are donating all the profits of this clothing range, the cool clothing range, to charity. So 50% um, will be donated to cancer research and also 50% to more of a local uh, charity called the Lennox Children's Cancer Fund. And as he states, he says, the money will mean more to the families and kids than it does to me and the operations director, Damien Clark. So good on him. Um, you know, he's got his own problems and he's, he's fighting his own battle and he's, he's, he's you know, doing what he can for, for research. So uh, wonderful. But I think what it really does highlight is, um, you know, the importance of understanding um, the power of the sun when we're out and about, the reflection of the water. Um, and for the amount of anglers that, you know, simply don't put on sunscreen, it, it's crazy, really. I have... A couple of big silly floppy hats when that sun gets too strong, a buff to go around my neck. Um, you know, I spent a long time living and working overseas, so my skin is very damaged anyway from the sun, and I really don't want to make it any worse. So, factor 50, slap it on, guys and girls, really, really important. Um, even if you think it's not that hot, um, you know, the ultraviolet rays are what are doing the damage, not the actual heat. So, really, really important. And, and you know, fair play to Danny. Fairbrass for for telling his story. Now here's a thing from uh, the most recent Angling Times that really caught my eye, and it's a uh, Martin Bowler. He has his weekly article in the magazine. And this one says, "Great torpedoes out of the blue." Essentially, what he's doing is he's made himself um, across country to West Wales, and he's fishing this mark off of some rocks for taupe. Uh, <laughs> What an exciting way of fishing. The if I thought about catching taupe, it would be out on a boat. Uh, West Wales, absolutely. We know that there's some real predators off that coast of, of Pembrokeshire. Um, you know, great whites have been have been mentioned from down there. So taupe, member of the shark family, you'd think out on a boat. But no, he's fishing off of a rock. Um, into not particularly far off of, of these rocks. On this, this point that he's fishing... 
Um, and, and catching these these soap ups are wonderful size. So that was a real interest. It's something that I want to do. I want to dive. I love my, my course fishing, of course. Um, ugh, the rivers are now open, as we've said, and, and I, I sneaked over to the Trent just for a couple of hours last week, getting a few roach on the stick, and yeah, fabulous. But I'd like to diversify a little bit more if I can just get an understanding of sea fishing. I think it's something that I could really take to. And that style of fishing looks fantastic. Not a lot of kit needed, a little bit of patience, a little bit of um, watercraft, I guess, uh, and away you go. So yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, Whales for taupe. Moving on then into Match Fishing Magazine and straight in page 16, an article that just caught my eye. Boom. Uh, just like that, it's Sam Jawed fishing the Grand Union Canal, and, and rather than the usual pole tactics, he's fishing a waggler, and and that is exactly what you know I did for for many years as a kid in my local canal. I didn't have a pole; it was fishing a, a Drennan Canal Grey um, or a, a Drake float, a Drake um, balsa waggler across the canal, an image one as well. I used to have image wagglers. Remember image? That was uh, the old uh, pollard and, and bird combination. Uh, it was the image tackle, and you'd flick it across three quarters over the, the canal and uh, ping a few casters over. And my local canal was so clear because it didn't have boat traffic that you could see the perch sort of flashing and ropes taking those casters. And if you was lucky and you got that bait to the bottom and the bottom was clear away from all the, the crap and the, the shopping trolleys, that you may just snare a, a chub or a tench as well. It was, it was wonderful um, fishing. Uh, I have to say, though, that this article from Amber is a lot more scenic than where I grew up. But the point is, um, it's not necessary to always be using a pole um, on a canal. Similarly, um, the way that you present the bait can be different. A short rod uh, flicking across a, a feature, perhaps loose feeding over the top. And, and he's putting together sort of 25 pounds of chub. Just brilliant days fishing and totally different from, from what you'd expect. I, you know, I've been doing a little bit of fishing with Dave Costa over the winter. And uh, Dave was telling me that he no, loves nothing more than fishing a waggler on the local canals in this area. And he, he's been doing really well, or he had. So previous lockdowns on the uh, the Fosdyke Canal up in, in Lincoln. Everybody else straight out with their poles. He's flicking a waggler across and catching way more and quicker than everybody else let's not forget the speed of a waggler versus a pole uh, in some respects can be much much quicker especially with a small fish so yeah I, it, it caught my eye straight away and a few pages further on in the same magazine um same canal actually grand union but different stretch uh, darren cox does something slightly different he is fishing uh, a pole on the canal and he's targeting bream and skimmers and he gives uh, pretty much a comprehensive like the go-to guide how to target fish on a canal four different flow patterns um you know the way you use elastic it's quite funny so like gone are the days of you know two three four elastics on canals you know using hollows etc and you know hybrids etc um pellets have a, have a big use uh, of course, shot worm for skimmers. So it's just how the evolution of canals and, and how to adapt, really. I mean, if it was for me, if I was to go on a, a fisher match on a canal now, I'd be a little bit sort of stuck between the old school, you know, the, the maggots, the casters, the pinkies, squats, um, and the new school in terms of, you know, pellets, expanders, fish meal, ground baits. Where do we go? How much are they used on these stretches of water? So, but Darren, spells it out and the proof is in the pudding with the net that he has at the end um just a, a great net of fish so if you are looking at targeting canals over the summer entering any of the canal pairs matches or individual national on the canal etc then you know these two articles are real food for thought when it comes to canal angling now here's a frustrating article as well We're the same magazine moving into page 42 will raise and this um it's under the feeder section and it's called the catch-all method mindset. And where this is frustrating is where I think some magazines get this wrong, and they must have a tough job to do it. But I look at this, and there is not a single leaf on the tree. And he talks about late spring and early summer herald the changes when the feeder angler needs to maximize his or her chances of putting a fish, weight of fish in the net. Now, Will's obviously been tasked with doing this, this feature, and it's the editing and the you know, the, 
the piece for Match Fisher magazine to, to do this, but it ain't late spring or early summer anymore. You know, we're talking mid June by the time I've picked this magazine. It fell on my door doorstep last week. Uh, the, the trees are green and lush and the fish are feeding like mad. So this article is null and void for me. You know, I need to read this. I need to pick this magazine up again next March or April, not now. So that's one of those frustrating uh, features where you just think, well, you know, that isn't aggressive enough, that style of fishing, what he's doing there now. And it's pretty pointless putting it in. They may as well have held that article or feature back until they're, they're struggling for content in spring next year so yeah that, that one is just just one of those things where you just think it you know it's not relevant now but what is relevant and where there is a feature with some greenery on the trees etc and, and i do get it you know it's uh you're never gonna shoot a feature as close to the launch of a magazine as possible it's always going to be a fair few weeks behind but this one looks a bit more relevant with dead ship fish and whips a place called Durley reservoir down in somerset and um, big water, big open water, how do you approach it? How do you dominate a match with small fish, you know, when they are the, the dominant species, if you like? And he covers all angles here as, you know, we, we get good value for money from Dead Ship, don't we? He, he does these magazines well. You do see a lot of the same faces in um, in a lot of these monthlies. And, and But when these anglers have got their... Uh, the monthly features you know the regular articles you understand why because you read it and you just think right yeah bang on and what he's done is he's put together this great stamp of of small fish um also looks like he's done a bit of film in there so it'd be quite interesting if he if he brings out a film for this but the way he's just bashed out a lot of small fish um in a in a pretty sort of quick space of time it's interesting as well, when you watch the way he hooks a maggot, he basically threads the maggot onto the hook. A little bit how you'd put a lugworm on if you was sea fishing. The idea is you're going to get as many fish as possible on one bait. And when you're fishing the whip, that's key. You can't be changing your hook bait every single chuck. So yeah, another another brilliant article by, by Des. And if you're into your whip fishing, um, you get some top tips on that one too. Yes, last thing in the magazine, which is quite interesting, is a section there by Joe Carras um, around uh, mugging. Now, mugging isn't for everybody, but he does his top 10 tips. So if you are planning on doing a little bit of mugging in this, it's relatively warm now, um, you might get some tips there as well. So on to improve your course fishing, and uh, an article that really stood out for me, page 82, as we, we touched upon this. Um, quite some months ago, I can't even remember what episode, we spoke about it in Series 1, and that was when the NHS were thinking about prescribing angling to people with mental health issues or, you know, to help with social issues as well. And why this stood out was because this was local to, to where I'm from, if you like. Um, it says, last month, the Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust partnered with fishing charity Tackling Minds and a pilot scheme to prescribe fishing for those suffering with mental health issues. Known as social prescribing, this form of treatment takes a holistic approach to health and well-being by connecting people with community groups for practical and emotional support rather than clinical services. This is now the first time that fishing has been added as an official option for healthcare professionals in the UK. We speak to David Lyons, founder of Tackling Minds, to find out more about the charity and the work that went into getting to this stage and there's a sort of a QA as we go through with some images of, of some of the um, some of the guys doing a little bit of fishing who they are and etc etc and, and for me it's it's such an important thing as I said back at the time you know um, the way that I think the mainstream uh, programs like you know White House and Mortimer and the, the tackle guru stuff that's gone out on Sky and you know, Rob Hughes and Andy Ford on that and, and getting into the mainstream, it sparks an interest. And I think in the past where, you know, if a doctor prescribed you fishing, they might have laughed you out of the room. But now actually people think, well, yeah, I might give that a go. It looks interesting. It's And, and this is one way of killing two birds with one stone, if you like. This, this will help without question people's own mental health. But of course, it will also bring newcomers into the sport and hopefully give them a, a passion for their life as well. Um, so it's it was one of those articles that just stood out straight away because it's such an important issue um, and well worth a read and, and good on improving course fishing for, for covering it off. 
So with the press dominated by the opening of the river season, um, I think uh, we've covered off everything that has caught the eye in the press pack. It's now time for the big chat. Teddy Fisher Baits specialise in the manufacture of fishing ground bait and additives. We combine a 40-year-old proven fish catching recipe and the experience of our skilled team. Fishing is an adventure and here at Teddy Fisher we strive to make that adventure a success. Go to www.teddyfisher.co.uk to see our full range of baits. Hi and welcome to The Big Chat. For this episode, we've got another world champion joining us once again, but this time he's from across the border. This is Welsh world champion from 1987, Mr. Clive Branson. How are you, sir? Okay, thank you very much, David. And yourself? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad at all. Thanks for joining me. It's uh, It's been really exciting. Looking forward to speaking to you for a while. Um, I've done a little bit of research, Clive, and before I get started, I want to tell you about... Um, my understanding of you or my first knowledge of yourself I was a little kid about 11 years of age I think I was and for Christmas in Santa's sack I had a couple of VHS videos with your name emblazoned on the front <laughs> <laughs> so the first one was I think it might jog your memory um I think you was fishing the Y around mm-hmm. Belmont stretch and it was flooded and I think it was a live match, uh, right. not, yeah. not live, but somebody had filmed you do do the match, and which is pretty unique when I go back to the sort of early 90s, thinking about mm. that. Yeah. Um, and the second video was a pool somewhere around Newport where you was fishing Bloodworm, mm. um, and you absolutely annihilated it, loads of silvers. It was, I think it was a park lake, really, near the city centre. And uh, yeah, so that yeah. was my first, first memories of, of yourself. And then, you know, the VHS is turned to DVDs and DVDs turned to, to the internet and all the rest of it. So, yes. <laughs> um, but let, what we do, if you're not familiar, we have a bit of a bit of a theme. It's called past, present and future. Now, okay. when I read up on yourself, you started fishing, I guess it was the TAF as a youngster. Tell me about how you got into it. Was it a member of the family or was it did you just learn just going with your mates? Yeah, right. Well, basically, um, I learned myself because uh, I was at the loose end one day. You're not far from where I live is the River Taff. And I think as a youngster, we used to go over there, you know, sort of play on the swings, you know, swing out on the river on the ropes and <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Anyway, I was over there one day and I seen a couple of young lads from school and they were like catching eels, you know, mm. with hand lines. And I thought, oh, that was interesting. I think yeah. I was about 11 at the time. And um, anyway, uh, I joined them and uh, I, I found, you know, I found it a bit of fun. I thought, oh, you know, catching eels on a hand line. Yeah. And um, that was the first time. You know, I really got interested in sort of fishing. I, I from there, I, I went into it in a bit more depth, and um, you know, basically, it started from you know with a bean pole from the garden, <laughs> with a little <laughs> float. You know, yeah. catching fish, catching roach on silkweed. Is that right? And, silkweed, so not maggots or worms or anything. Silkweed. No, That's no. interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, in them days, of course, you know, we didn't have the maggots and like and casts and things like you have today. Yeah. And so, you know, we had to find our own baits, and um, yeah, it was good. In fact, um, I, I did go on and win the Welsh Junior National using silkweed. <laughs> Is that right? Well, it's interesting because yeah. that makes me think of all those baits that have come and gone that have yeah. have those types of ingredients. And yeah, mm. and I've, ne- I've never fished with anything like that. It's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. Did, uh, what was the evolution? Did you join a club? Was it a bunch of mates? How did, how did the match fishing start, I guess? Yeah, well, the thing was, uh, we didn't know any different at that age. You know, we were going over the river. And then I think I seen you know, one of the lads or some uh, uh, guys who were older than me, and um, they said, you need a license to fish here. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, what happened? Uh, I got introduced uh, to the local club that owned it, um, a club called Glamorgan Anglers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, well, uh, I joined uh, the match fishing side of it because that took my interest. I think I was about 11, 12, mm-hmm. 12-ish. Yeah. yeah. And then when I first competition ever entered, um, I actually won it uh, at twenty pound. I, I, oh, wow. um, I was about twelve at the time, and I beat the um, the organizer. 
uh, I'll never forget. And <laughs> it was round the bog because who's this young lad come along and won the match? Yeah, so you're, you're banned. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> but they were good old days, yeah, good memories they were, yeah. And I think that's that's really important, actually, for anybody that's listening um, mm. that maybe is venturing into match fishing. My, my, certainly my advice and the theme of mm. a lot of these conversations that the top guys have I've said over the years is, you know, join a club, find your feet mm-hmm. um, and sort of go from that. But I know some of the anglers, a lot of the commercial lads, um, the likes of Andy Bennett, they just kicked off straight into opens and, and sort of jumped into the frying pan, if you like. Oh, yeah. And But for me, I think to be a more, to be like a rounded angler and understand lots of different waters mm-hmm. and, and methods, I think joining a club's a great way of doing things. So that's, it's interesting that you, you followed the same sort of footsteps as well. Um yeah. International fishing, Clive, that's what we mm. want to talk about. This has been a okay. big, big theme that mm. I've spoke to Tommy Pickering, Ian Heaps, who you know these guys very well, of course. Um, yeah. You know, talking about international fishing, Darren Cox as well from from the mm. feeder side and from when he's fished Euros. And it, it takes a certain type of angler, I think, to, to represent your country. Now, with Wales, mm. a relatively small nation, but relatively successful. I suppose even, you know, re- more recently, the European Championships back yeah. in your day, individual world champion in yourself. And of course, uh, mm. the overall winners in 89 when Tom picked up his gold. So how, how how do you get into that mindset? How do you sort of focus for international fishing? Well, at the time, I think it was 1980, 1980-ish, um, where we had, um, there was a chap named uh, John Mayer and um, Deco North, which were, they used to organise matches over Newport. and. Um, you mentioned that lake we were fishing with a bloodworm. Well, it was uh, from that area. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I think because we were fishing matches over there, um, John May has come up with the idea, we, you know, about uh, joining uh, the Welsh Federation, because he was a, a secretary of the, the um, Welsh Federation, about joining the uh, FIPS and, and gotcha. enter the Welsh team, you know. And, uh, of course, uh, I was... Um, well, I, I personally wasn't asked originally because um, they had a bit of a um, uh, eliminator. You know, they used to get a few anglers together and, and see how they yeah, they'd like all... a trial, yeah, yeah, like trials, yeah. And we and we, uh, North Wales anglers were invited and um, South Wales in, uh, anglers. In fact, we were fishing North versus South, you know, to <laughs> sort of eliminate and get the find out who the better anglers were. Of course, yeah. and uh, and what happened because um, uh, this, uh, John Mayers and Dick North they went to uh, the first uh, world championship they went to was in Ireland and uh, sorry, no, in um, Germany and they they watched the the Germans when they absolutely uh, pulverised the opposition that year. Mm. And the following year was um, it was our opportunity because it was on the Warwickshire Raven at Ludington. Ludington, yeah, that's right. And yeah. it suited our boys because we were river anglers. You know, if you ever fished a taff in certain areas, you know, and and even up the north on the River Dee and that is very similar to the Warwickshire Raven. Mm. So we had these eliminated matches, and I think in the end. Uh, there was a there was a the final six, um, and I was I was one of the members, you know, to have fished it then. Now your your style of fishing as well is mm. very well known as a, as a float angler. So yeah, yeah. thinking about the <laughs> Ludington, like you say, that it must have been suited you right the way down to the ground. And but when you won it though in eighty seven, was that on the on the on the um, the waggler as well, or was that yeah yeah slide? that was on the waggler yeah 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 because the funny thing was. Um, you know, when we fished the Welsh Raven and, and we actually come third, the Welsh team, um, we had a band of anglers, which I think personally were probably the best anglers Wales ever produced. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and uh, the fact was we went on and come third, um, uh, even though it was the, the river was being, you know, uh, went to flood the second day. Yeah. You know, um, I was in the individual and I actually caught an eel and I've come 17th in the world on my first attempt. It's so, not bad, is it? You know, that one bad. So having a bronze medal. Anyway, from then on, we thought we were the kiddies. Of course, it took a few years then before we actually uh, uh, were successful. You know, we were, we were we were going to the world championships, costing us an arm and a leg. And um, we, we ended up, if you like, getting very friendly with the English boys. That's who I got to know, uh, Tom and Kevin Ashes in particular, mm-hmm. um, and all them. And uh, we, I think we learned a little bit off them. Yeah. And, of course, when it came to um, uh, uh, France, because that was the time that I, I made a name for myself, because um, I, I was second. I come second, uh, second yeah. using the waggler on a canal. 
Was and that then, 86? So that's the year before uh, but, you won, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, that's right. 86 was the year. Uh, and I, anyway, I uh, came runner-up, and I was unlucky not to actually win it. But that's another story. But the following hmm. year, um, in Portugal, I went on to win it using the waggler, a conventional waggler. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and it was, I think, the first time a competition uh, the world champions ever won using an, an, a, a waggler in that type of fishing, if you know what I mean. Because when Ian Heaps won it, he used the waggler, but he used the slider, slider yeah. which is slightly different. Of course, um, when I won the world championships, it was it was um, I was in great company because I don't know if you've read my autobiography and that, but oh, I know it was either side of you, but you can tell the listeners definitely. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was fishing. I had all of the the best anglers in the world next to me, as far as I was concerned. You know, um, Dennis White, um, Dennis White, uh, Kevin, Tom Pickering, myself, <laughs> uh, and uh, and even there was another lad who, who's not mentioned these days from Wales. Giles Cochran, and yes. he was uh, quite a good angler, and he, he just missed out on the medals himself that year. But um, anyway, it was a great uh, match because it was, it was a fish for fish, and it was on the dying seconds I managed to, get, <laughs> managed to swing a fish in, and the whistle went. So I just Fantastic. beat Kevin Atras by, oh, I know, ounces or half ounces or something, something really, really tight, you know. <laughs> what an amazing thing. And and it's oh, funny yeah. because um, we spoke about this with Ian slightly as well. The, the format then was different, wasn't it? Because you had the team event on the, the first day, yeah, and you had right. the individual on the following day, and it was a real... It was a test to get into the individual match anyway amongst the well, squad. And then, yeah. to, to like you say, you can draw against anybody. Mm. And that's a bit of a section of death you was in there, to be fair. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, th- the thing was, um, you know, uh, again, it, I suppose it suited me. The team didn't do, do actually do very good at Welsh team that year. I don't know why, but it, it suited but it suited me in, in particular because I actually um, went over there um, a week before and uh, to do a bit of practicing. So I got used to the venue, you know, quite easy and quickly, you know. It's funny you mentioned then about costing an arm and a leg, because obviously back yeah. in those days, the sponsorship wasn't, mm. you know, as it is nowadays and whatnot. How did you yeah. afford to, how did you have to afford to have time off work and whatnot and pay for yeah. it all? Well, if I tell you a little story, because you mentioned about those videos then. Well, yeah. you know, in them days, I had my own business. I had um, a video business, uh, which was quite successful, and I could afford to, I suppose, take the time and afford to go on these matches because you know it was costing us a minimum of a thousand pound you know if not uh, more you know double that um of course um we did find a way all the anglers who were selected did find a way of getting the money together mm. and uh, we didn't have any major sponsorship until you know we actually won the world championships and um going back to the videos i uh I was, uh, if you like, in the, because I was in the video business, that's how I managed to make a few videos because I was approached by a video wholesaler who happened to be an angler mm-hmm. who, who always had an ambition of, of making some videos uh, because it hadn't been done before. Yeah. Um, I think Ian Heaps may, may have done a couple of promotional ones for the uh, Irish Tourist Board, but nobody had put together a proper, if you like, um, uh, uh, video. So I suggested um, the, um, some match fishing ones and also how, how to fish. And uh, the name of the company was Clean, um, Clean River Anglin. And, mm-hmm. of course, uh, the story went on. I don't Again, it's in my autobiography. But I, I go on to tell uh, how uh, I was invited by Dave Hall, magazine to go up um, uh, to do a feature and he asked me who done my videos and I anyway I introduced him to Clean River uh, Mick Shepherd and all uh, those guys who were doing it and, and they uh, went on and made a load of videos afterwards so yeah. that's how that's how I suppose in a way I was the pioneer of, 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 of fishing videos and my notes that we'll work through is that um yourself and this is one of the big reasons why i wanted to speak to you talk about pioneer and pioneer being the first or one of the the startups i've got a list of stuff here that you are instrumental in so if 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 we take that if we take the the video game which and as i said at the start of this podcast i don't know if it's going back to like i think this this video was filmed around 90 i don't know of any videos that were out then where you filmed somebody fishing a match because it's Mm. for want of a better word it's it's shit or bust, isn't it? You know, a day's filming. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. could absolutely I'll, go tits up. I, uh, I, know, I, I know that because I, I, I do a fishing vlog now on YouTube. Mm. I've got a couple of thousand subscribers. And, the, you know, um, I don't profess to, to win every match, but I try my best to at least 
um, you know, get in the frame or a, a section just to show the views. But you, you, as you say, with match fishing, it's very difficult to uh, um, to plan it. You just don't know what, what's no, going to happen. For sure. I mean, it's easier now because you, you've got your GoPros, you've got your editing suites. But to actually yeah. take a cameraman and even potentially a sound man on the bank for a, for a day, and and you oh, know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very, and that was back how it was back then. So massive uh, step. And like you say, Clean River then went on to to go and produce all sorts, which must have mm. ultimately got thousands and thousands of people into fishing and ultimately match fishing as well yes yeah yeah so yeah, in, in fact uh, I, uh, a couple of people have mentioned over the last few years uh, how how uh, like yourself saw my videos that it inspired them mm-hmm. you know to to i suppose go on and become match yeah. so, you know, 100 i can always remember i said this is me going on a slight tangent is that mm-hmm. there was there was your two videos and i remember i got another one and it was gaza right yeah, fishing the ten mile bank over in the fens with Phil Briscoe. That's right. Randomly, and it was around that sort of period. It was just, and and you're right, it did. It's, I mean, I would, I, I think I fished my first match when I was eleven, and it mm. was around that period. And you were just sort of trying to get every tip out of the the videos you could to to see <laughs> yeah. how you go. I mean, the the, the world you're oyster now, isn't it? The information at your fingertips oh, is yeah, amazing, yeah. but um, yeah. uh, you mentioned Giles, Giles Cocker. I know Giles uh, from from mm. a little bit way back when when I used to fish dock or pools quite a lot so mm-hmm. tell me about other Welsh anglers that either are right. underrated such as him or maybe yeah. you know should, well, should, should be making the frame if you like for, for international fishing well of course in my day um it was more natural fishing you know than, than it is these days where we saw mainly poor um uh, in my day, of course, uh, I, I can name a couple of anglers who I think were really outstanding. Go for it. Um, you know, I mean, Phil Davis, he, he come he come third. Uh, he's a North Welsh lad. Mm-hmm. He come third in, in uh, on the Arno um, in, in the World Championships. Was that 85? Is that the one Dave Roper yeah, won? That's the one, yeah. yeah. The one that Dave Roper won, yeah. Then there was um, uh, Richie Bainton. Now, Richie, unfortunately, he doesn't fish anymore. Um, he, he had cancer and, and uh, he stopped fishing. But he comes, um, uh, he was second, um, obviously third in the World Championships when Tom Tom won it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was a, a, an outstanding angler, you know. Um we, we, there's a lot of quality anglers in Wales, and as I said, because maybe for that we had a very lean patch over twenty odd years, uh, where a certain person uh, run the team, and um, uh, well, I don't want to go into too much. Oh no, no, you don't have to go down yeah. into politics. Yeah, well. a lot of people call it sour grapes, but we, we never, we never want to be. In it. And when he when he retired <laughs> or got sacked i should say mm. um then a new manager took over and what lo and behold a year later they become european champions just goes to show you we have got the anglers uh talented anglers in wales you just need a guidance if you like yeah <laughs> and, uh, absolutely yeah, yeah I, I was asked to go for a manager's job as well but uh you know um at the time when when I had an interest to do it. Uh, obstacles were put in my way. So, uh, but since then, of course, you know, I, I think I'll leave it to a young, you know, younger generation. You just stole my thunder because I was going to ask you exactly that oh, question. Right. So that, <laughs> you know, that's great. Absolutely. I was going to say, were you ever, was you ever yeah. interested in throwing your hat in the ring yourself? Because, uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the new manager this year, Ben Roberts, he's, um, uh, yeah, I've had a word with him. He's a nice lad, and uh, you know, I wish him all the best, and uh, um, I hope that they. You know that they can, uh, if you like, get the honours that we had uh, during the eighties and nineties. Because you know um, we, we were top of the well. You know we were doing very well, put it that way. You were, we yeah. were always Rankings. in the, the top. You know the top frame. You know and uh, you know and um, we, you know, as I said, it was it was great great memories. And, mm. you know. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. I mean, mm. and and bringing bringing things forward a little bit more into sort of like the present day. It's mm. it's really interesting, sort of. Um, how you again talk about innovation and, and evolution if you like is that you, yeah. you brought a lot of um items of tackle from the continent to the uk yeah. for the first time as well tell us a little bit about some of those brands that you introduced over here well yeah it's it's a it's a funny thing because you know innovations w- were the key in them days you know because you can go to the shops and, and buy certain things what you needed and we learned a lot of our uh, techniques methods and and tackle uh, from the continental anglers and one thing in particular you know that sticks to my mind was um, um, uh, 
uh, wagglers and stick floats uh, on winders because I remember we're fishing against one of the uh, Swedish team, I think it was, and I, I was um, I was actually uh, beating him at one stage mm. uh, in uh, uh, the World Club Championships. This was, and he anyway out, out of his bag, he pulled out of a, um, a pole float on a winder and he put it on his rod and line mm. and started using. It. I thought, blimey, me, uh, you know that's a great idea. I thought, let's let's look at putting sticks and, and wagglers on winders. So that was just one little innovation that I introduced. You know, and I started talking, writing, and the angler. A lot of anglers. Let's do that now, yeah. yeah well, every, yeah, well, ever since they do. Now, the other thing you could talk about um, ground baits. Now, I got very friendly with um, Van der Nind and, uh, mm. and a couple of the uh, Dutch guys, and of course, yeah, and French guys. And I, I learned that the, their their ground baits were, were were different from each other, but very successful. Um, you know. Uh, anyway, that was another innovation. I I thought I'd, I'd introduce mix, mixes of ground bait, which I did over you know, 20, 30 years ago now. And then, as you mentioned, the line. Now, in the t in our day, there was only a couple of lines on the market, and that was Bayer yep. or Maxima. Um, and then uh, I was into, um, I was introduced to a chap named Dubosi, which was the Water Queen um, uh, owner, and he had an ambition to try and get the uh, high-tech lines into the UK. Well, Water Queen, they, 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 you know, they had some great lines at the time. They were like double strength lines. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they were a lot thinner, a lot stronger than what we were used to. Of course, it was a uphill struggle to try and get it into the marketplace. Because I remember going around shops, trying to, you know, talk, um, you know, them into stocking it, and a lot of them said, "Oh no, that won't catch on," <laughs> and, you know, and so on. <laughs> of course, they will be low. No, years later. That's all we ever use these days, you know. So, so we're we're talking pre-stretch low diameter line now. Aren't we? Yeah, this is exactly, exactly what everybody's using. And what yeah, year exactly. are we talking about here then, Clive? When you were trying to get that well, on the market? Well, that that was when after within the World Championships because um, I was recognised, uh, you know, as uh, uh, by the continental anglers, you know, the, the French and the Italians, and that as being very good with the waggler. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, and they, they wanted to introduce the line then. So it was shortly after that, which was 80, 87, um, 88, but 88, 89. And it's what we're all using now, as you rightly yeah. say. It's, you know, it yeah, just, yeah. just goes to show. <laughs> it just goes to show you, you know. So, yeah, you know, as I said, uh, innovations was a thing. Even today, I mean, uh, you know, obviously there's tackle coming out, uh, you know, and... Um, you know, we're always improving on ourselves, but I think in them days mm. the learning curve was a lot steeper than it is now today. You know. Well, as we said before, you can just the click of a mm. button and you you know you can get yeah. instruction. Well, that's right. I mean, this is another thing I I've mentioned in in a couple of my vlogs. You know, where anglers these days um, information is so easily available. Mm. Where before uh, certain anglers were, were always top of the tree, if you like, because they they you know they I wouldn't say they kept secrets, but it, you know. It was in the know, you know, like Kevin Ashley used to say, it's, it's what you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and of course, when the advent of the internet and, and social media, then everyone shared an information. And now it's so easy for anglers to, to pick up and learn. And, you know, I'll be honest, when I do my vlogs, I, I keep it open. Uh, you know, I tell people what I'm doing, you know, and mm -hmm. I... And yeah, I, 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 I enjoy it anyway. Yeah. Well, it brings me to actually just yeah. mention the internet and we talk about information available. Again, a bit yeah. of a pioneer. I, I yeah. can't think. Your your website, um, yeah. Anglin News, yeah. um, I don't know of any match fishing websites with as in-depth as yours at that time. So this was launched in 1997. Um, next sure. year, that's 25 years, Clyde, just to make yeah. you feel even older, yeah. by the way. Um, yeah. So, again, a bit of a pioneer. What made you think, oh, this internet's going to take off? I need to do a fishing right. website. Well, <laughs> that's another story because um, at the time, um, my uh, I was involved uh, in, in a tropical fish business and uh, with my brother. Now, uh, But what happened, we split the, um, the partnership and I went down the video route yeah. and he stayed with the tropical fish route. And what happened was that um, uh, he got into computers uh, yeah. um, and when he got into computers, we also uh, it was up the di it was called a dial up in them days, of course. Yes, you know, <laughs> very computer. slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, uh, my brother was the first internet provider in South Wales. He um, he managed ah. to uh, yeah. Basically, what what happened? He'd he, he got a contract with the uh, Cardiff University to um, 
uh, to supply me the computers and to set up an intranet, yeah. uh, which was the, um, uh, the, um, before the internet, you know, connecting all the computers together. And then they went, then eventually they got on the internet using, um, using the dial up. Now, it was my job. Uh, with my brother to go around to try and sell websites. And again, I come across the same barrier like I did with the line. Oh, this is a fad. This will never catch on. Mm. <laughs> and I remember going around uh, tackle shops and um, and fisheries uh, owners and saying, look, you know, you need a website. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. And, you know, <laughs> no, we're all, we're all using it now. So at the time, I was the first one to set up uh, an angling uh, website at Anglin, uh, as I say, anglinews.co.uk. Mm. And uh, from there, I um, it was quite a big site at one time. I did have, because, uh, you know, of course, you have social media like Facebook and uh, Twitter and all that then in them days. So uh, mine was the, uh, uh, if you like, the forerunner of information. And I used to get mm. thousands of hits, yeah. you know, per day. But, of course, things have changed these days. I still got the website running and when I remember to. <laughs> To upload it, but one thing I have done, I've kept a record of the World Championships events um, since uh, ni- well, since since it started, I think, back in the nineteen forties. So, if anyone wants to see results, they can go onto the, my website and on one of the pages. Um, there's a list of all the winners and, t- and team winners throughout the years. Yeah, and you've got your link to your yeah. vlogs and all the rest of it, and that brings us actually to the to, to yeah. your vlogs and to your, so. And again, thinking about size and scale. Mm. Your match fishing social media page um, mm. is one of the biggest, mm. um, certainly in the UK that I can think of, even bigger than some of the big tackle companies that everybody, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, pour over. And we've got around, I want to guess, 28,000 likes, followers, something like that. Is that yeah, right? That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I started off as, as a, as a um, um, I suppose, a buy and sell group in a, in a way. But I was getting inundated with people who wanted more information rather than selling. And uh, so I, I converted over to a general um, angling, match angling page where, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it just grew and it grew. And mm. as I said, you know, it was maybe maybe because I was already in the Internet and I, I suppose I knew about uh, promoting it and uh, Anyway, yeah, oh, second. definitely. I mean, I know, I know the score because I do a bit of um, mm. work for for a bait company, and just just the man, the hot, the managing and the admin pieces. Um, I'm dealing with sort of two thousand followers. You got twenty eight thousand, so you must do all sorts of uh, vetting oh, yeah. and whatnot. But no, it's well, worthwhile. Yeah. I, well, I tell you, it's a full time job. It's an unpaid full time job because yeah, exactly. I, I've got to delete so many things, and even Facebook are on my back at the moment, like with people with their. Um, <laughs> bad language yeah <laughs> and also, of course yeah. oh and lately I, I've, had, I've, I've had to turn into a um, private members club now anyway I mean anyone can still see it and, uh, and they can uh, join but obviously I've got to approve it now but where before people could join um, you know as long as they answered a few questions uh, they could join but now uh, I, I've got to vet them all only because I'm getting People outside of fishing trying to jump on on a, a successful Scams and all the rest yeah of it. social media you're trying to scam you know like the bitcoins and uh, you know and things like that and it's amazing really and yeah, I, yeah. when I did the the research and the bits of me and I've not read your book and you can you can talk to the listeners about the, the name and where to get it in a second but yeah. just doing some general scanning around on the internet I, I, everything I looked I was like crikey he was ahead of the game with that. Yeah. Bloody hell! I've not that that didn't come out till a couple of years ago. He was talking about ten years ago, and every time I went through, it was yourself. And it's almost as if you were too early in some respects because people like well, that ain't working. <laughs> you're, you're probably right, you know, because uh, when I look back, you know, um, as innovations, and you know, if if you if you innovate something, it's hard to for you know to get it going, and it and all of a sudden, you know. Uh, somebody will pick up on it and um and then it becomes successful and yeah well you know <laughs> it's 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 luck of the draw sometimes i think and uh, no it is it's one of those yeah. but it, you know yeah. there's, there's there's always uh luck always balances out but tell us about your book tell us about your um your autobiography right well uh yeah i, I wrote my autobiography a couple of years ago and uh, the reason i wrote it i wanted to get a few things off my chest <laughs> oh really <laughs> you know, okay r- rather than uh pull myself up or nothing like that but um anyway i wrote it and uh i've had a couple of reviews on it um some good some bad you know as i said i, I i'm not a professional writer and i think i just write it the way i see things and and um anyway um but it, it's uh, it starts off from 
uh, the first uh, day I went fishing, as, as we mentioned. Mm, on the and, uh, Yeah, and it, and it goes on then to, um, you know, through the World Championships, um, through uh, a few ups and downs in my life, you know, where I got flooded and lost everything on, at Evesham and tried to set up again and uh, um, uh, up in a pub, you know, uh, yeah. taking fishermen, you know, angry coaching. See, I was coaching in them oh, days. Oh, no, we're going to get to that as well. It's on my list. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go to that next. Yeah. I was going to say, I was coaching long before anyone else did. So, you know, but um, anyway, the, the fact was that uh, uh, I went through a bit, a bit of a rough time and I gave up fishing for a little bit and, and I come back and... Uh, you know, and I, I well, I picked. It took me a year or two, but I, I picked up on it, and I, I was back in the frame again. You know, yeah. just um, still enjoying it even today. And and where can we uh, where can we get the book? Is that off the Angling News website or is it right? It's one? just on Amazon because uh, if okay. anyone. Uh, if anyone's aware, uh, anyone can write a book these days, <laughs> and Amazon will, will promote it. And uh, you, you, you get a small royalty. Uh, you're better off having it published, you know, publish it yourself, really. And you know, which I know. Tom has done it, and uh, another, another angle, a little plug, uh, Brian Bennett from Usham, he's, uh, he's brought a book out now. He has, it's called My Life in Match Fishing, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Because that was another book I was going to write uh, about. I did write another small one not so long ago, um, uh, you know, Living with Legends, and I talk about all the uh, past um, England lads, you know, as you say, Dennis, Tom, mm-hmm. Tom Pickering and uh, Kevin Ashurst and uh, Bob Nudd and all them, you know, which I I was fortunate to have made friends with over the years. Yeah. So, um, and it's quite interesting that. I, I also wrote another book about, you know, um, you're talking about innovation. So I also got a website called goldmedalfloats.co.uk. Yes. Now, yeah. again, um, there's, uh, I talk about floats that I got introduced to over the over the years, you know, from the continent and that, and um, I talk about uh, how you know how to use them and uh, and so on, and, and even how to make them uh, because you, some of the floats you can't buy in the shops, and again it's an innovation. But I've also turned that into a book as well. Now um, people can buy that book directly from me because I can actually print that myself or <laughs> from Amazon and. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I'm into writing books lately. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic. I've always thought about writing a book. It wouldn't be about fishing. Um, it's about yeah. some, some, <laughs> some other things I got up to when I was younger, but, uh, yeah. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've actually written uh, a couple of books because um, I was in sales for many years. Yeah. And um, I was into uh, um, going back uh, uh, when I wrote about, in the Anglian Times once, about positive mental attitude, and uh, I... I wrote about uh, where I used to self hypnose myself, you know, and and visualize. Really, myself. that's interesting. Oh yeah, visualize myself winning matches, and and uh, and I I, I uh, admitted that I I done it when I won the world championships. Of course, the Anglian press picked up on this. I remember reading an, uh, an article on front page of Anglian Times uh, one week. It said, "Is Clive Branson uh, brilliant or balmy?" <laughs> ah, it sounds a bit Yuri Gellerish, like you know, make the ball yeah, move. Exactly. Sort of thing, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, I got ridiculed over it, so in the end, I uh, uh, I I didn't promote that, that so much, you know. Um, but I have written a couple of books about sales and subliminal uh, messages, and um, you know, and uh, and uh, uh, because I was very successful at, sale, uh, at sales as well. So <laughs> oh, we we could this uh, will be on a tangent here. We could talk because I work in sales as well. I mean, uh, we can oh, talk about right. all sort the nudge theory and things like this. Yeah, you know, it's, there's, there's, and there's a lot to it. And and actually, yeah. transferring that sort of attitude and and, and mm. you're right, people will take the mick. But yeah, to transfer the the the, the yeah. thought process of what I call converting yeah. into yeah. converting a bite ratio is exactly the same. I want yeah. somebody. I want to sell a product, and I've got to convert a certain ratio. Well, actually, yeah. I, I want to. I want the fish to eat my bait, and I've got to convert the bites into into fish rate. So it, it yeah. is. It's there. It's there. That it's how you logically think yeah. about it. So that's well, really interesting. In, in in my later latest book, um, you know, uh, Living with Legends, I talk about uh, the famous Dick Walker. I don't know if you if, if you ever knew a Dick Walker. He was a, a famous angler. He was. He was the cat, Clarissa, yeah. the cat record yeah. holder. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, I remember reading an article once uh, in um, in the Anglian Times, and he talked about the sixth sense of an angler, and uh, and I thought, oh, you know, very interesting because nobody else has ever written about the sixth sense, which which we all have, um, you know, when it comes to fishing, uh, and um, I, I touched upon it 
slightly, you know, uh, about about Dick Walker because, uh, as I said, he, he was a man ahead of his times as well. And um, but yeah, this sixth sense that I think uh, a lot of anglers have it's it's like it's like when you build a mental picture up and you swim, you know, when you plumb the depth and when you run a float through, you you get to know where the the hollows and and the, the depths and and the current and and that. And you know, some anglers can pick it up quicker than others. You know, some have to work on it. You know, and I think. Um, through positive mental attitude, you know, and, and visualization, you, you can achieve these things. But, you know, that's something, you know, maybe I'll write about one day. <laughs> I like it. I, I could talk about that sort of stuff all day. It's, it's really yeah. interesting. And, and yeah. the, 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 there is a theme throughout these mm. these podcasts. And if you get a chance, if you've not listened to it already, have a listen to the one that I did with Rob Hughes, because okay. I wanted him to join me to talk about this type of thought process and that where mm. does the um, – the, the disciplines of carp fishing and match fishing cross over because the the lines have become more and more blurred over the years with commercial yeah. commercial fisheries and and he goes in to explain around the way that a carp angler would feed you know those lads feed the size of a tennis court whereas we're putting in little toss pots and, and whatnot and and that sort of logic and and he talks a little bit about fish psychology I think you'll enjoy it um, oh, yeah, okay well yeah I, I would because you see you know. I, I, it's 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 been a um, uh, how, shall, how shall I put it, uh, uh, th- it thoughts of, of of that sort of thing. I, I've always thought about that in my years of vision. Uh, it's like boxes, you know. You get two boxes, the same weight, the same uh, sort of size, uh, the same uh, re- you know regime, but one will beat the other because one has a more of a mental uh, positive attitude. And it's the same with fishing. This is why you get people like uh, Hughes and, and all these who are top of the tree, and the others uh, are following them because it this mental attitude and and this uh, uh, you know belief that that um, that that they can win, and also sussing out if you like the the, the fish how they feed the psychology of fish, and you know as well as the uh, conditions and, and and so forth. So yeah, you know it's it's very interesting stuff. So th- there's a quote which goes along nicely with what you've just said there, Clive. And yeah. It's Muhammad Ali, and he says that the will must be stronger than the skill. And it's as simple as that, really. You can have all the skill in the world, but if your mindset isn't in the right place, then that's yeah, not going to yeah. happen, is it? And yeah. I think match fishing is, is the same as any other sport. And, I, and for me, it comes yeah. back to that, um, that stupid question when somebody says, well, is match fishing a sport? And mm. of course it is because yeah, you, yeah. you are competing against other people, plus the elements of nature, which makes it even more fascinating. So, mm. no, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm bang on board with it, with exactly what you said. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a little example, right? I got a very good friend called Spud Murphy, mm. right? Very well known angler, yeah. Rap. He's probably the, one of the most successful anglers throughout the country you know he's, he's won the john smiths he's from twice he's won the river fest he's you know and he you know he's won loads of things but when it came to the world championships he never seemed to do it and i don't know why because he had the ability and i always put it down me he didn't have that positive attitude you'll probably kill me for say that but uh you know i don't know some anglers have got it and some haven't and uh you know as i say um uh well, I, well, let's 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 bring. <laughs> I hope he listens to this. That'd be hilarious. Um, and if I ever come down Wales, I don't want him to sort of hang me dry for. for oh, yeah, no, it's <laughs> um, a very good <laughs> Let's talk then a little bit about coaching, because again, coming back to this innovation, I, again, looking at the dates of when you began taking people out and teaching them how to fish is a long, long time ago compared to yeah. every Tom, Dick, and Harry seems to want to do it uh, at the moment. Mm. So, what what are the most? I mean, it's a really basic question. Actually, Clive, but it might be one for some of the listeners to pick up on. What are the basic errors that you always see? Well, um, I, it's frustrating because there, there's many uh, um, uh, frustrating things I see when I coach and people. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll try to explain to them uh, what I'm doing and show them, and then they do exact opposite. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, sometimes I, I don't know. Um, I, I teach people to my ability. Now, well, I can say that I've actually taken a couple of people coaching, coaching, never won a match before in their life, and and after a bit of coaching, they've actually gone on and won matches. Satisfying. Yeah, that, no, that to me that is satisfying. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, and it, you know, I get a lot of um, you know people 
San Kimi for taking them, and then, and you know, they send me messages saying, you know, I always improve them and and that. But you know, the main thing is, I I, I try to put them right. Um, you know, I look at the, any faults that they have, and if I can put them right, I will. You know, otherwise, you know, it, it's just a day out with me fishing, and you know, so they enjoy it, and you know, you know, I'm happy with that. Well, I think the main ones I always think of when I see, um, not even youngsters, you know, these are mm-hmm. these are people that think they know what they're doing. It's probably plumbing up. Um, I, I just, I, I just don't think people understand it. Um, mm. I don't think they spend long enough. Um, mm. the topography of the bottom of a lake is so important or a river. Mm. I, I, I don't think, so there's always common mistakes that, you know, and, and it's funny cause it's normally the lads and lasses that have got, you know, more gear than, than the local taco shop, but actually you see them plumb up and you think they're not going to win yeah, yeah. because you know, instantly. <laughs> I mean, the other thing as well, which a lot of people probably don't realize, is the thermals of the water as well, you know, because, uh, you know, you, you can fish areas and you think there's not a fish there, but if you mm-hmm. put a, a scanner in the water, you, you, you see there's loads of fish there. It's all about, you know, the thermals as well. So there's there's a lot more to fish than people, you know, think sometimes. It certainly isn't it? And that was, again, I, what I was looking for for guests mm-hmm. for this for this big chart is um, what I always mm-hmm. describe as um, as a thinking angler. Um, mm. And one of those thinking anglers uh, I admire a lot is Nick Speed. Um, right. I did a bit of coaching with him a couple of years ago, and I left the session with my mind blew. And he joined me on one of these podcasts and talks about thermoclines. Uh, he yeah. talks about the importance of it, high pressure, low pressure. Swim yeah, yeah. management as well is, is a uh, real yeah. when to swap, when to stick or twist. And, and it, yeah, I mean, you could just go on for it. You're never going to teach them in a day, Clive, are you? That is no, for sure. that's true. Anyway, coming back to Nick, I, I was, uh, where was I? On, on the World Trade in Evesham, and uh, he came up to me, and he's, he said, uh, oh, I used to watch your videos. <laughs> Another one. There you go. Yeah. He said, he said I, I encouraged him to, to, to go fishing. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Nick's a good angler. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's um, you know, I follow him quite a bit on Facebook and that, and uh, does quite well with commercials. So, you know, which is brilliant. He but he's does. also a good as well. He is. He started yeah. fishing those um, uh, those sort of peak district lakes and those big mm. reses around around sort of Sheffield and whatnot. So, yeah, he, yeah. Can, he can put his hand to all sorts. Tell me about Lee Edwards. Um, yeah. I've always been a big fan of Lee Edwards. I think he's a cracking angler. And uh, do you think well, potential to win the Worlds one day? Um, Lee is a little bit like Marmite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You either you like him or you or you don't. Um, it's only because of his uh, uh, attitude, I think. You know, uh, um, I think yes, Lee is about the only angler that I can see on the horizon who could possibly win a world championships. Mm-hmm. Um, only because he's got that mental attitude. He and, got, and is that what gives him the the what might be misconstrued as a bad attitude? It's because he's yes, so focused. Th- yeah, 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 I think it is. I think it is. You know, um, he, I know, I know, he's a bad loser, <laughs> which is a good thing in a way. Because I was next to once on the River Y and I beat him, and he wasn't happy about it. But <laughs> uh, no. Um, I think Lee, uh, and I, I have mentioned it in my, uh, I put him down as one of my legends, a uh, living legend, because uh, although, he, you know, he's only, um, uh, I think he, he had a bronze in the world champs, he did, yeah. but he, he could possibly have won it uh, if, if things had gone right for him that day. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, potentially uh, he has got the attitude to to possibly uh, be, you know, I'd be happy, you know, if, if you know, as you know, I'm the only Welsh uh, angler ever to win the world championship so yeah it would be nice for maybe with someone else one day to do it as well up and coming anglers any names that uh, we need to keep an eye on but do you know what there, there's a uh, the bunch of anglers uh, really i fish uh, with on the um on the dock uh, port harbor dock i saw your way. recent vlog on there actually uh, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to fish there. I really would. Real yeah. fascinating fishing. Oh, it is. It's uh, you know, it's, it, 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 so many methods you could use on that water, mm. you know, uh, and frame, you know. So uh, uh, I, I try to be a little bit different. I pioneered a, a waggler up in the water. Nobody's ever done it before. Uh, and I think it was uh, last season, not season before. Um, I had a fifty-one pound. A 53 pound, a forty-eight pound. Yeah, I saw you on... pull out like a sliding waggler. On, oh, on a bow yeah. rig as well. well that, was a, no, that, that was a sliding, uh, uh, what I call a sliding, um, um, I call it a dock special because it's it's like a sliding balsa float. It is, yeah. But, but yeah, with antenna. And it works 
perfectly. It was brilliant, yeah. Because, you know, if you can imagine when you're in striking and there's nothing on, you can drop it in the same hole without lifting the whole thing out of the water, you know. That's a good training ground for a, for an international yeah. scene, I guess. Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it, it, it resembles a lot of uh, um, venues where you go. You, a lot of venues you fish abroad are quite deep, you know, and uh, this, you know, this would... Uh, suit any angler to practice in fact i think a, a few anglers who travel to ireland um, go there and do a bit of practicing mm-hmm. you know okay so by the time this goes live clive we will the river season will be open so what are your plans for this year's uh the, the river attack shall we say right um the, the thing is um Dave, um i don't know if you've followed uh, uh, me at all over the last year or two but um i I married a Thai lady, and I went to Thailand and, and done a bit of fishing. I met her with uh, Billy Makin. Oh, yeah, and, yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, there's a bunch of anglers over there, match, uh, ex-match anglers, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Dennis Dixon and, uh, and a few others. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself over there. And I always wanted to sort of like have a semi-retirement and go to Thailand. Ah. Um, and because of the COVID situation, uh, I haven't been able to get back for a year. And, of course, of course. my wife... My wife and I, she came over here, and um, well, we've had a baby, and I haven't seen the baby since it's been born, really, and that's oh, going no. on nearly two years now. So, um, so anyway, um, I in- I hope to get back maybe by October this year. Yeah. Uh, but before then, I had to plan my matches, and so what I've look, what I'm looking to do is to fish the Walsh Raven, a couple of the Riverfest matches, and the float only matches on the River Seven, which I've got my name down. So uh, I'll have a little bit of a busy season uh, leading up to October, you know, mainly fishing the Wallach Raven, the River Seven, and the Bristol Haven, hopefully, if I get over there, because I like that. I got, I got a ticket for New Ridge for the uh, Riverfest. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that, that'll be my uh, main. Main sort and then of hopefully the rest of the winter in Thailand, I guess. Well, this is my ambition. I'd like to do that, to be able to go there and then come back, you know, fish the summer and, uh, you know, early early sort of, uh, you know, up till September maybe. Oh, brilliant. You know, that if, makes if, sense. If, if things work out. No, of but, course. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I got to tell you as well because I started like a little bit of a match uh, circuit over there when I went over there a couple of years ago, and um, and it, it it was attracting a dozen or more anglers, which is great fun. Well, that, but, uh, I do remember yeah, reading in uh, Billy Makin was doing a monthly piece in Match Fishing Magazine, and he was talking yeah. about how he'd, he'd gone on a few of these. So yeah, I've got to, I, I can visualise it, but fishing yeah. must be crazy. Yeah, well, let me tell you. I mean, uh, this is the problem because a lot of the fish have got teeth and 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 spikes, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't really. You got to careful by handling them and and also keeping them in the net. But if you go for tilapias or, or something like that, um, they they got carp over there and uh, and um, you know that sort of thing, which you can keep in keep nets, I suppose. But what we were doing, we were we were catching our fish and weighing them individually, yeah, uh, and then weighing them, uh, adding up at the end of the match. Now. Billy makes me laugh, you know, because when I first met Billy over there, I, I've heard of Billy, of course, over the years, but I never really met him until I went to his bar. Yeah. Anyway, I persuaded him to come along on one of our matches, and, he, and he's come on one, one or two of them. Like, he said, oh, he's telling, I don't like that. No, this won't suit me. Anyway, since I've heard he's fishing all the bloody time over there. Yeah, he is. He's, he's got the bug again, isn't it? That's he's got the bug is. again, yeah. I like the thing I, I encouraged him, because I remember him sitting behind me once, like, you know, and... Uh, well, well that, actually, it's like quite a nice, uh, a nice link into this into another piece here. I'm just thinking. So Billy yeah. Makin, obviously, pretty much well known as as the the inventor of the commercial fishery, if you like. Yeah. What, what's yeah. What's your thoughts on commercials? Do you fish them? Do you not bother? What's are you, are you still well, a natural uh, man or what? Yeah, I am a natural man. I tell you what, uh, we're in my uh, sort of um, uh, breakup of uh, losing. Um, my business and everything through the foot and mouth disease, you know, um, and also uh, losing my guest house in the in the uh, with the floods at Evesham, mm. um, and I gave up fishing, and it, that was about the time when I in commercial starting to make a bit of a you know a, a, um, if you like a bit of a breakthrough. Yeah. Uh, and when I came back, I did try commercial fishing. Uh, all I can say about commercial fishing is that because um, I was a fish keeper for many years, and uh, and I, I knew a little bit about uh, about carp in the sense that you feed them on, you uh, wean them on pellets, and that's all they'd ever eat after that. You know, mainly. I think commercials rejuvenated fishing. 
Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, because fishing was on a, a downhill slide then, you know, until commercials. And even a lot of anglers uh, my age are, are older now prefer to go commercial fishing because mm. basically you can drive to your peg, you know, you haven't got to worry about maggots. I mean, you can get, you just get a, a you know, um, a, 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 a bag of pellets, yeah, bag of pellets, and you know, you haven't got to keep them all. Like just before I come on there with you, I was sorting my maggots out now, you know. Well, anyway, I did try commercials, and um, but I, oh, I don't know, I, 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 I couldn't get the grips using heavy line and big hooks, and mm. and and um, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm a, more of a skillful angler. I like to use you know, finer lines, smaller hooks, and you know, and work for my fish. You know, uh, it's a, what I found yeah. fascinating as well is that mm. that the the switch over, and and it's yeah. you've made a conscious choice to you know stick to what you like doing and and. That's yeah sort of finer style of fishing whereas yeah. i'm fascinated by i'd love to get alan scott on on one of these because what yeah. he's doing at the minute with covid and it, there is no international fishing per se so he's he's just threw his hat in the ring to all the big finals all the big qualifiers he's getting yeah. in the finals he's winning big matches and he's just flipped over to commercials like a duck to water tom's yeah, yeah. done the same you know yeah. and it just goes to show that this mm. mindset of that it doesn't matter yeah. where they're fishing they can adapt you know? Yeah, I think I think if you enjoy doing, it, I mean, don't forget Ian Heaps was, was another one. You know, he, he, got, he got his own fisheries now. You know, That's, um, yeah. all commercial. Yeah, Have you yeah, been? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been down there. You know, I I, um, I haven't I don't fish his matches like because uh, it's a bit too far for me to travel. I mean, it's quicker for me to go to Bristol or Wagstaven from from where I live. But um, yeah, you know, so yeah, you're, you're right. I think if you're an angler, if you've got the the natural ability, then yeah, you can make the crossover and 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 do well but uh I, it's never appealed to me that's all i can say you know no, I, prefer- I get it i get i think i think uh yeah. on on the in apes podcast he does talk about making that switch that you're talking about and it was at a place yeah. called um castle ashby over in northamptonshire and mm-hmm. he uh <laughs> he, I, th- I can't remember the exact one um but it was something like he fished 13 matches and won 12 and he would never even fished a commercial before because he just just cottoned onto the feeding and yeah. um, I have a bit of a rule me when it comes to fishing. It's a three-step rule mm-hmm. that it's location, presentation, feeding. They're the three rules that mm-hmm. you know you stick to. And I think if you can get halfway on all of them, you're in you're in good stead. And these lads, you know, chaps like yourself, they just know yeah. what you're doing straight away. So it's interesting. But you did a but you did a guide though, isn't it, on um, on Welsh venues? I assume that does include commercials, or is that just natural venues? No, no, that that includes all commercials. You know, um, yeah, it's a six hundred page uh, magazine, and um, I well, I I converted to a website as well. Um, it's called oh, give us that. It's fishingguidewales.co.uk. But um, I might uh, I, I might let that go because. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've taken too much on in my life, and I think you know Up something. Again. Something yeah. I need to let go. I think you know. Give it to <laughs> give it to somebody else to sort of take on board. It's funny though because with mm. with the Welsh uh, scene at the minute, I've, there's a friend of mine lives in the north, and we we chat quite a lot. All the the, the the new qualifiers that have come up with the the tourist board and whatnot, so the Dragon Mania and and all these yeah. side of things. It's got to be positive for for the country, oh, yeah. hasn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, for years I, I tried to get Wales on the map, and it was difficult. You know, mm-hmm. uh, then that's the reason why I moved from Cardiff to, up to uh, Evesham to get into the, you know, uh, after winning the World Championships, to, you know, to better myself, if you like. I, I, I had to move to um, to get recognised and and you know, fish more matches and uh, uh, where in Wales, you know, as far as the. Uh, uh, the water authorities were concerned, you know, if it didn't have spots on it, they weren't interested. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I get that as well. I mean, no, that's yeah. really interesting. We, so, I mean, we've covered a lot there in the past. We've spoke a, a lot about the present with all your your, your vlogs and your um, social media side of things and yeah. the, the gold medal tackle as well. And we've touched yeah. a little bit there on the future, the Thailand piece, um, which is really, yeah. you know, you want to get across and see that little one, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think to, to wrap up and, and just to sort of finish off, there's one name that has cropped up on how many? So we're on, this is the eighth one, I think, seventh or eighth podcast. And I think yeah. in at least six of those, the same name has cropped up over and over again. And it's Kevin Ashurst. 
uh-huh. everybody's name checked him so many times to say yeah. that he is their greatest angler of all time. Who yeah. would be yeah. your favourite uh, greatest angler of all time? Well, you just named him. You just named him. <laughs> you're in that. You're in that camp as well. Is yeah, that right? Well, let, let me tell you a little story about Kevin. Absolutely. But when I it. when I was young, uh, we're fishing the River Taff. Of course, we used to have a, a few matches, open matches, and um, lo and behold, Kevin used to come along to them. And I, I was only about, I don't know, 13 or 14 at the time. I did, you know, I read about him in the papers, you mm-hmm. know, and, and of course, like Survivor Max and people like that, and and Benny Ashes, his dad, and Billy Lane. But seeing Kevin in, in, in the flesh was brilliant, you know. I thought, oh, you know, and of course, when he, uh, at the time when he first came down, there was a disease called the columnaris uh, disease, which was uh, wiping out the road throughout the country. Oh, right. But when he when he came down the River Taff, um, it hadn't touched that. And uh, and I think that's the reason he came down, because it was great. Uh, and when he came down, I think he won the match or come second, and you in yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, got talking to Kevin, and um, you, you know, uh, I couldn't understand what he was talking about because uh, uh, of his dialect. He, you know, the Orita, <laughs> yeah. stronger than mine, isn't it? And I'm from the yeah. northwest. Yeah. But anyway, I always admired Kevin. Of course, when I came into the World Championships, I made a beeline for him. You know, <laughs> and I got pretty friendly with him, and we used to chat in the nights. And uh, and when I went to Ireland, I used to hook up with him. We used to go fishing with him, and uh, and he became a really, really close friend. And when I um, and this is before winning the world championships, and of course when um, when I came runner up, the Cardiff Nomad uh, Club mm. held um, a surprise sort of uh, you know uh, party in my honour of becoming second, which was right. a great achievement, yeah, you know, great achievement. And who was the honour uh, a guest? Uh, a guest was Kevin Ashes. He came all the way down from Lee to um, you know to uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, join you know to me uh, that uh, you know he he's always been a great uh, favourite of mine. But I even went I went fishing with him a few times. I remember going up the Trent once and talking about innovations. He's an innovator because I remember we because of the wind situation, got a lot of wind out on the Trent. I remember and uh, anyway we were trying out these bolognese rods, you know, twenty foot rods yeah, with yeah. stick with stick floats, you know, trying to combat the the drift, like you know. And I I always thought oh a great method that was you know down to Kevin then. There you uh, go. And yeah, so um, I I didn't see Kevin for over 20 years and it, I've written in my autobiography it, it, in that uh, uh, 2006 I went to Ireland first time in a, in like 25 years yeah. and uh, and uh, I bumped it well I, I seeked him out because I know he goes there and we, we had a pint together like you know fantastic and, uh, I got a picture of me and him at the bar <laughs> with a pint in the <laughs> propping up the bar uh, but made me laugh like he he got a cup of teeth missing and he's like, oh, before we take the photograph, he put my teeth in, so he put his teeth in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, Kevin, you're so vain, I said, because uh, we had some we had some laughs uh, over in Ireland because we used to, uh, you know, go have a drink and go dancing around uh, together. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. And, and as I say, it's, it's just every second. Yeah. I've not purposely brought him up or anything it's just as we've spoke yeah, people to, say, yeah. his name has cropped up on at least half a dozen of these and it's yeah, um, well, all, all i can say all i can say is is that he actually um uh, when they discussed world championships um in the evenings mainly um uh, <laughs> it, the he evenings. was always um he's the the the, the man who, who really sort of put tactics together what i gather looking at it you know quite often uh, like dick clegg would um you know would go off with him or talk with him you know alone and that sort of thing you know and i think before um, dick i think stan smith used to do the same with him like you know so well, yeah he, he was so knowledgeable and uh, such a great a great angler you know i think th- i can't um again i'm trying to pull this from the podcast but there was a line that ian said and it was fantastic and he said the greatest yeah. thing that kevin ash has said about me is that yeah. ian eeps is great when he's on the method but the greatest <laughs> thing i'll say about kevin ash is that he is always on the method yeah and that was the sort of the, the difference and i think tom said about him it was a slightly different angle from tom but tom said something like he was our leader so you can talk yeah, about Dick exactly. Clegg and all you want, but the reality is that he was, the, yeah. you know, that that he was the guy that sort of pulled yeah, us well, up. Yeah, that was the impression that I got, like, you know. Mm. And, um... Was you the Welsh leader, Clive? 
<laughs> well, I think I was actually for for a couple of years, you know, because uh, our manager, uh, our manager John May, is one an angler, but he's a great organizer. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when it comes to methods and tactics, we used to get together as a team and talk about how we we're going to do it. And as I said, we, we had a very successful uh, few years, you know, um, the Welsh team and individually, you know, uh, myself a silver and a gold. Um, we, we were fourth in one world championships. Uh, we, um, Richie Bateman was second, and um, and uh, Phil Davis uh, sorry was third, and Phil Davis had a bronze medal as well. Uh, and all in the space of about seven eight years that I was involved with the Welsh team, mm. it was the most successful time we, we've ever had. And I, I think it was down to the fact that yeah, maybe I did help the lads. We got together, and you know, we shared information, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, you do need a, a talisman, you know, in in, the, in any team i think you do gareth bale oh yeah yeah gareth bale's another one <laughs> well let's let's finish on that how are they going to do in these euros well <laughs> i'd like to think they you know my my uh my head tell, my heart tells me they're going to do well but I, in my head i'm thinking oh after the last performance yeah. <laughs> they struggled when they, they they did secure a draw but uh, uh they got hey, the Swiss, of, Swiss are no yeah. pushovers so you never know it's not a bad you never bad know start. yeah Yes. Well, you know, they, they do say this the Welsh team this year uh, is as good as the uh, you know the the uh, the one five years ago. So you never know, you know, you never exactly. Know. And they got further than the English as well. So you never know again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> brilliant, yeah. good rivalry. Well, listen, Clive, it's been an absolute pleasure to chit chat to you. It's been brilliant. Um, All right, thank you. Hopefully, the, the, you know that's. Um, you get mm. some more hits on your on your website. We get some more members following match fishing and uh, yeah. maybe yeah. a few more well, book sales as well. I mean, uh, obviously, if, if people want to follow my vlog on on YouTube, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to build that up. I, I've got about uh, what's it, two thousand six hundred members, something like that. Now, you know, more than me, um, I've got twelve. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what's yeah. the uh, the name of your YouTube channel? And just so we can well, post. if you search for Clive Branson, it's um, Clive Branson, uh, Matt Richard, You know, oh, there we go. Um, it's it's a regular vlog I do. Um, you know, every time I go fishing, and I just roll the cameras, and uh, and uh, you know, obviously uh, they see warts and all. You know, yeah. <laughs> even see even see my tangles. I say, I, I was um, you know, I was amazed when I saw so you whip out this big old bolsa float on a yeah. like a slider tactic. It's very interesting. So I'm sure there's yeah. lots to learn on that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm bringing out little little t uh, little snippets and little um, uh, tips. Now, you know that uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I do get some nice comments of it, so that's good, you know. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, mm -hmm. I um, again, thanks for your time. I wish you all the luck in the world on your, your river uh, quests, and hopefully you get over to Thailand and see a little one soon. So. All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks, and thanks for your, for your time. Opportunity. Okay, cheers, mate. For all your fishing needs, be sure to check out Fishing Evolution. Boasting two floors of branded displays, visit our recently expanded superstore at Hadley Road in Sleaford, where we offer a huge range of tackle from all of the leading course and cart brands, such as Nash, Fox, Corda, Drennan, Preston, Guru, Daiwa, and many, many more. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, where we share all of the latest news and updates about products available in store. Hello and welcome to the Tackle Shed. Um, I've poured over the monthlies and the weeklies, um, had a little look through, see what's what. And of course, we've got a bit of tried and tested to talk through as well. Um, but kicking off with match fishing, the latest edition, um, which is the June 21 version. And following on really from the early article from Ahmed Jawed, where he's fishing a waggler on a, on a canal, it really does take me back. Uh, page... 82, the new gear section um, of Match Fishing Magazine. Top left-hand corner, Benick Sports. It seems to be that these are the guys now that are the main distributors for a float that brings back some real memories uh, linked to those canal days by Drake Floats. Um, now, Drake Floats are actually from where, where I hail from, um, in, in Valesworth in Manchester. Um, been going for many, many moons. Uh, Drake Floats used to have a, a cracking team from Middleton, great success in Angling Times, Winter League Finals, etc. Back in the uh, in the nineties, and uh, they were all supplied. All the guys in the team were supplied with Drake floats, whether they be pole floats, waggles, etc. And they are superbly made. Uh, and this range of canal 
floats. They're made from balsa, handmade in the UK, as I say, perfect for casting across canals, drains, or using on whips, uh, £2.40 each. And looking at them, I can just say it, it takes me back to the 90s. They're just fantastic floats um, and something that uh, I think I might well invest in uh, if, if when I get on the drains pretty soon. So uh, that caught my eye in the new gear section. Uh, a couple of bait boosters and liquids and things like that in there as well. There's some... XL liquids from Dynamite. There's a Sculpex booster from from Sonya baits. All stuff to you know boost your fishery pellets and and, and just give your bait a bit of something different. So there's bits and pieces in there. Uh, moving through though, uh, I like this section. Uh, close up special on pellet waggler gear. And what they've done here, match fishing, is they've looked at uh, combinations. So combinations from different tackle companies. Uh, the first one I really quite like the look of. So this ignition pellet waggler rod that was launched earlier on in the year. We spoke about that in a previous um, episode. This ignition range of, of rods in general around that sort of 45 to 55, 60 pound, very affordable rods. Um, there's also a, a more budget orientated reel range called inertia so what they're trying to do here is they're combining the ignition 11 foot pellet waggler rod with the inertia 300 size reel the combination is about 100 quid um it goes through shimano with the x5 and the vanford dior ends on uh reel and pellet waggler rod it talks about the guru engage of course they haven't got a reel just yet browning's black magic range midi's reactor core and gfd reel uh, and reeve reeve have got a, a pellet waggler rod and what's called the mf 4000 pro so working through the range basically at matrix as well you know their rod and reel combos coming in at something like 260 quid the reeve one's over 300 pounds so there's something there for everybody um not really a chance to to fish the pellet waggler just yet even with the weather as it's been a lot of the fishing so far this summer um shallow wise has been with with a caster or a small four mil pellet on that sort of pole line um but looking forward to get the pellet waggler rods out uh, you pays your money you takes your choice but the guide in match fishing may well come in handy so that's match fishing this month uh, angling times very disappointing i'm not gonna lie um tackle reviews not a lot going on whatsoever no lot to get stuck into no real bargains highlighted a little bit sort of samey samey so uh big thumbs down for angling times for the past two weeks and um, i've not been able to find anything worth discussing uh june version though of improve your course fishing um if you're looking to introduce somebody uh, to pole fishing shakespeare super team i've got a new pole out extreme carp the ranges the price was what shocks me for an eight and a half meter which could be used i guess as a, as a good margin pole or up to a, an 11 and a half meter which is the longest uh, price range from £135 to £220. The disappointment of that, which is expressed in the review, is that you only get one kit with the pole, which is very disappointing. However, the spare top twos are only £27. Uh, in terms of performance, great for beginners, great for, for those that want a, a budget pole. Um, so that's worth having a wee little look at if you're looking to you know introduce someone to the sport or you just don't want your kids messing around with your your expensive model that you uh you normally use so yeah shakespeare super team doing a lot of work in the background releasing some some good products by the look of it uh, lots of memories using shakespeare so, caught my first fish uh, on a shakespeare rod so uh fantastic so that's improve your course fishing a little bit of tried and tested for you so i mentioned on my facebook page not long ago um i bought a new suit now i use in the winter i, I invested in the savage gear a little bit stranger than being a bit of a predator range and me more of a, a match angler but savage gear heat light range brilliant fantastic suit uh, but of course as soon as spring took hold uh, it was just a bit too warm so in the past i've had a bit of a combination of of sort of just general outdoor wear, um, not specific fishery brands, etc. But I thought it's time to invest, you know, get some a little bit flashier, um, get the old name on it, etc. And and of course, initially I was dragged down the, the Hulk and Hunt route is what, is what you want to do. You know, it's the, we know it's the best. We know you get that guarantee, fully Gore-Tex, etc. And I was willing to invest, you know, a, 
a little tidy sum to make sure I've got a, a robust suit that will last the, the test of time, I guess. Um, however, on contacting Hulk and Hunt, uh, the lead time was something like five months, which meant that if I ordered now, we're talking sort of October, November before I'd receive it, which uh, I need something quicker than that. And my mind cast back to a conversation I had with a friend of ours, uh, Mike McCabe, a couple of years ago, and he, he bought this kit from Leon Grant. Now, Leon Grant's a name that's been banded around for, for years and years. They've been making uh, fishing clobber as well as sort of shooting and outdoor pursuits clobber for, for many, many years. Another Yorkshire company like Hawken Hunt. So I got in touch, I got a price list and uh, checked it all out. And if anybody's come across the the Real Elite um, range that was, you know, uh, it did the TriCast kit, the Baytech kit, etc. It's Leon Grant clothing. So that caught my eye a couple of years ago as well. So I reached out, got a price list and uh, submitted my requirements. And uh, Kev over at Leon Grant got back to me really, really quick, designed me what I wanted and the colours and the style that I wanted sent me some pictures, um, mock-up designs. I agreed, uh, made the payment, and my new bib and brace and pole jacket, my elite pole jacket and elite bib and brace, were in my door within sort of 10 days. Uh, fantastic. I, I didn't, I could have gone for a bespoke uh, bespoke sizing, you know, made to measure, but uh, I just went for a standard sort of medium. Um, brilliant, R- really good. So anyway, obviously I've been out now and give it a good trial in over these last sort of uh, month or so and really really impressed um i had an absolute drenching at lindholm last week now i did get a little bit wet on my stomach and that's because i didn't lift the flap over the bib and brace so it's a bit of a school by error uh, but other than that bone dry not a problem it's padded and lined so even the wind i wasn't getting chilly so really, really good piece of kit. And in fact, I was so impressed the first few times that I used it, that I actually rang up and said, ah, oh, you know, I made a mistake. I wish I'd have ordered it first round, but can I have the, the fleece, the windproof fleece as well? So I got that designed, knocked up, and again, that was delivered within a week. So really good service from Kev at Leon Grant. And, and touch wood, so far so good. I've had an absolute drown and it rained. Six hour match, it rained for probably five and a half hours last week. And uh, yeah, a, a tiny bit of wet where I'd not covered uh, my front only disappointment is on the bib and brace it's not a two-way zip so when you're going to uh to use the low you've got to zip down and then you know it becomes a bit awkward so that's the only negative i'd have um, on the kit so yep tried and tested i've been soaked and i've been fine so that was a leon grant kit take a look it might be something that that uh, catches your eye especially when you can design your own as well Another one, um, pole floats. Preferences on pole floats is is unbelievable. Um, I've used RW floats for a long time. I've used, uh, I think I've mentioned in the past that that the Malman Bennies, I was a massive fan. You just can't get hold of them anymore. But I flipped over to, I still use a slim float for a lot of pellet fishing. Um, But anything with a little bit of chop on the water um, or anything you want to really dot down, I've been using the Guru Pinga, the wire stem one, for, for quite some time now, probably about a year. Um, and I've got to a point now where it's becoming my go-to flow. Um, so one I'd highly recommend is, it, it, you know, you think it's obviously his design, Mick Wilkinson, etc. You think it's just not going to be made as well as, as you know, these handmade floats, but they really are. Combine that with some of the Ian um, Ian's floats that I've been ordering recently as well and you know i've got pretty much my whole fishing covered with this pinga range covering a lot of open water fishing and the ian's floats for everything else so lots and lots of of good feedback for that too so that wraps up the tackle shed and we look forward to looking at some new gear in the next episode (laughs) 